Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today, an award-winning novelist, has a Ph.D. in Buddhist studies and a B.A. in both psychology and philosophy. She's a former Stanford professor in Buddhism with a focus on the role of women in intergenerational families. Her book, Things Unsaid, is a multiple award-winning novel, USA Best Books Awards finalist, Beverly Hills Book Awards, Reader's Favorite Award winner, and a Pushcart nominee. Her second novel, Deeds Undone, A Mystery, continues the narrative of things unsaid, and A Perfect Match is the name of her third book. When not writing, she creates mixed media art. Her art has been in museums and galleries in California, Hawaii, and Japan. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Diana Paul. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm thrilled to be a part of this podcast. Diana, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Well, I would say that it was just about the right amount of time that I expected to write the book. It took about three years. I was a retired professor, but I was engaged full time in multimedia art, mixed media art. And I was also writing a movie review blog. I would say that I was right on schedule with writing this novel. Well, you tackle so many difficult questions, including depression, marital strife, and sexual identity. What makes you want to delve into such profound subjects? Well, as um, a trained psychology major who thought she was going to go into um, the psychology of children, I was always very much interested in family issues. And we had a women's group. It was part writers, part artists. And we would get together and we were just kind of enjoying talking to each other over dinner once a month. And it was always discussion about families that perked people up. And those were the conversations everyone remembered. So what inspired me actually to write this novel, because I'd never written a novel before, but I've written academic books, was that the stories were so interesting and unforgettable. So I decided I was going to make a composite of some of those stories into characters that would represent some of the conflicts and dramas of flawed characters and why they had those um, dysfunctional characteristics, partly because of their family backgrounds. You've had three books on Buddhism, one of which was translated into Japanese and German. Did you grow up in the Buddhism tradition or did you gravitate to it? No, I did not grow up as a a Buddhist, even though my father is ethnically Japanese. Um, He was a Protestant And my mother was a Catholic. So I think in the sense that religion intrigued me, I was um, very interested in philosophy and religion as an undergraduate. So I had a double major psychology and uh, philosophy, particularly the philosophy of um, Germans who were influenced by Hinduism and Buddhism. So I got interested in Buddhism sort of through the back door of German philosophy, if you can believe that. Hmm. And then I pursued my PhD in Buddhist studies with a focus on Buddhist psychology. 
Wow. Talking about these three books that you have written, can you tell us more about your inspiration? Well, as I said, my women friends, we all have great stories. I mean, if I were to talk to you about your family, especially given your book that you wrote, partly because of uh, ideas of family, feelings of family, maybe imagine, imagining um, different sorts of families that you could have come from or different sorts of families that you would create. It was just so intriguing and compelling that I actually started recording some of our conversations and I would give everyone a heads up. Now I'm going to record you. You might find the story someday in one of my novels. So if you don't want that, let me know because I am recording you. And some of those stories, somewhat disguised and um, oftentimes changed, did end up in one of my stories. So real people did inspire your characters. Absolutely. And also, I would say books and movies and television series. I'm, uh, as I said, a movie reviewer. So I watch a movie or a couple of episodes of a mini series every night. And some of the current series and programs especially just have phenomenal narratives and extraordinary writing. And that will inspire me given what I see as certain themes. And I especially like dark, flawed characters, sort of uh, anti-heroes. And some of those inspire me too. Well, tell us about your journey to publishing. Well, um, I've always liked to write. And I was a writer of our school newspaper. I was the editor of our high school newspaper. So I guess you could say that was published in a way. And I was uh, very happy to see my essays and opinion pieces in the newspaper. And then um, in college, I also was involved with the uh, writing department. And then after graduation and after my uh, PhD, when I taught at Stanford, I wrote essays, both essays for academic journals and then also three uh, academic books on Buddhism. But I have to say that fiction and writing my first novel was a completely different journey. Um, one of the reasons, probably the primary reason, is that when you're writing nonfiction, it's uh, very much at an arm's length distance. When you're writing a novel, you really delving deep into your own feelings and imagination. And I think it's more of a blood sport. <laughs> That's a good description of it, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Fiction is a whole different animal. I, I have found the same thing to be true. Yeah. Well, tell us if you chose a traditional path or if you went to a hybrid um, press, did you... Uh, self-publish? How did you handle the actual publishing? Okay, well, as I said, I always liked writing. So when I thought about uh, writing a novel, I was still at Stanford, and I went to some writing conferences, and I met a lot of people. And one of my close friends, who actually was a faculty member at Stanford also, she had a friend who was starting a press, especially for memoir or for Romana Clef's novels that were loosely um, fictional, but also had some memoir in them. And she suggested She Writes Press, which is a hybrid press. So I went to the editor of that press, who was a friend of my colleague, and I was very impressed with what they were doing. And it was early in their um, foundation of the press. So I had a lot of attention and a lot of support from them. And there is a community of sister authors from She Writes Press that is fabulous. We share ideas for promotion and marketing and what our next book might be. And um, I think it's a wonderful way to start your publishing journey. Well, you mentioned marketing and publicity, and that's uh, a whole different ball game for our writers. You know, they like to be sitting in their offices writing. And when they're told they have to get out and market their work, sometimes they are really taken off guard by that. So can you uh, tell our listeners anything that you found that works or maybe that doesn't work? 
uh, marketing and promotion are completely different enterprises, you know, since you've written a book. And I guess I would say that writing is just part of it. I mean, your writing is the solitary introverted uh, activity to get the book produced. But on the other hand, and this is my number one recommendation for anyone out there who's thinking of writing a book or in the process, you need a writer's group. I think a writer's group is invaluable. And that's what I loved about She Writes Press is that we also have a social group on Facebook so we could share ideas and uh, promotional and marketing uh, suggestions. And I would say that the writer's group is sort of the first part of marketing and promotion in the sense that you have to make your ideas uh, digestible and attractive to the other writers and they have to do the same to you. And so in that sense, you're starting to think about pitch lines and tag lines and how you describe your story. And I think it's the first initial dipping your toe into the promotional and marketing aspect, but it's a completely time consuming uh, day if you spend it all marketing and promoting. There's so much social media and there's so many book events, even in the lockdown, you know, there's Zoom events. So you have to be able to uh, measure how much time you wanna do marketing and promoting and how much time you wanna write. It really does take us away from the writing itself when we have to um, do our own marketing and, and promotion and everything that goes along with it, whether it's book signings or, you know, getting out and, and visiting libraries or bookstores. And, and yeah. we really want to get back to that office and, and do more writing. Do you have a writing routine? Do you, are you a morning person or a night person? Or when do you squeeze in your writing? I'm not a morning person, but I write in the afternoons because I want to uh, watch movies and TV and see what kinds of fictional themes are, are really compelling. So I would say, get up late. I have my brunch. I read all the news headlines to see what's going on. I might be reading some uh, reviews of other books that I think would be good to put on my list. I read two to three books a week. So then I start my, my writing process probably around one. And then I go depending upon uh, how much momentum I have till five or six. Those are a lot. That's a lot of reading every week. Yes. How, how can you possibly get through that many books every week? And, and tell us what you're uh, reading and, and what authors you might suggest for us. Oh, my goodness. There's so many books. Um, well, I read in the morning to, before I wake up. So I'm having my brunch and then I'll be reading for about an hour after brunch. So and then I read before really, really night owls. We don't go to bed till close to two. And then I get up at 10. So, I mean, okay, we finish reviewing or um, actually watching a movie or a miniseries. I might be taking some notes if I'm going to review it for my website, for my blog. And then I'll read for an hour or two every night. So that's three hours of reading besides the, the news. And I read very fast. But um, I read one book on my Kindle and one paperback at the same time so I won't get confused which one I'm reading. Right now I just finished uh, My Monte My Monticello. It's a wonderful book by Nicole Johnson. And it takes place uh, not quite science fiction or futuristic, but it's right after Charlottesville, Virginia riots. And so she goes and visits Monticello and she is a descendant of Sally Hemings. So it's kind of uh, putting Thomas Jefferson in a different historical uh, background. Very, very memorable. And um, I'm reading The Partition by Don Lee. I'm going to review that one because I review books, which is one reason why I read so many books a week, too. And I review for the New York Journal of Books. And that one is... Um, one main story about um, an Asian American woman and how she um, is treated and viewed 
especially by men in a very sexualized way. But that's only part of the story. I mean, I, I just started to get into the story, but um, it's a male author, but he's writing from a female perspective. So it's intriguing. So that one I'm going to be reviewing. Books to recommend. There are so many I can't even start to begin to tell you. Um, as I said, my Monticello, I just finished. So I loved that one. Um, I read The Push recently. That also is an excellent one. I'm kind of pulling a blank now because there's so many of my favorites. They, they've become favorites so quickly. And um, as I said, I have to review an awful lot. So but, you you read a lot of different genres. Yes. I like, um, I don't read much science fiction. In fact, hardly any. So the partition is probably um, a little bit uh, futuristic and especially like Monticello goes into that. Um, but I will look at that more in movies and miniseries. So it kind of influences me that way. But I like books that have extremely flawed, sometimes tragic characters, making all the bad choices and suffering the consequences, but you understand why. Those are the ones that I really love. So I definitely do have a certain taste, Julia, in terms of what I will pick up. I don't pick up any um, rom-com in general, unless there's kind of a little twist underneath it, you know. Um, I don't read um, many mysteries, although I love mysteries in terms of movies and miniseries. I don't tend to read some, but I'm starting to get back into some mysteries as well. And I always read a nonfiction one, too. So I read two fiction ones simultaneously and then one nonfiction. I don't know how you have any time to write. <laughs> well, let's say I'm obsessive. That's probably the nicest way to say it. <laughs> Driven, <laughs> insane. Do you, do you have another book in you? Are you working on something else? Well, this one that I, I told you, Deeds Undone, which takes uh, things unsaid and makes it into a mystery because uh, someone dies and things unsaid and you don't know why. He dies on the university floor of his office. And I turned it into a mystery so that um, you start finding out why he died. He didn't die just collapsing from being uh, maybe sick with you know, a heart attack or something like that. But um, I've got this, this is something that writers would consider a nightmare. I've got the manuscript and I'm tweaking it and there's some corruption in the draft. So am I working on it? Yes, but now I've got to find somebody to help me before I can start doing the edits. So I'm really struggling with that right now. And that's only a couple of days old. Well, why don't you uh, tell us about, choose one of your books to tell us about and read a few paragraphs for us so that we can sit can hear your tone and voice in the book all right i'm going to read from things unsaid because that's the one that's been published deeds undone i'm still working on the draft of that so i will start here um this is from the chapter safe harbor and safe harbor is an assisted living community and that's where the matriarch, the mother and grandmother of the story, the anti-hero, deeply flawed character, is um, volunteering in a consignment store across the street from Safe Harbor. And this scene, she's in the um, consignment store getting ready to volunteer for the day. How's our favorite volunteer? Francine cheerfully greeted Aida as she entered Yellow Brick Road, the buzzer sounding off. Aida smiled. She derived energy from the other senior women at Yellow Brick Road. By comparison, she was a showstopper. Francine had come out of the back room to say hello. Aida, guest or co-volunteer, must have been there tagging new donations and entering them into a ledger before hanging them on racks. None of that for her. What a snooze. She had to be in the front where the action was, where people could see her. Not in the back room far away from admiring eyes. She was so good for business. My, Aida, you certainly dress up, Francine said, looking her up and down. All the women did that. Aida loved it. She knew she was still attractive, even at her age. You're only as young as you feel, she thought. 
that's what she tried to impress upon her two daughters. But only Joanne listened to her. She often felt she had spent most of her life as an old woman, not a young one. Seemed unfair somehow. But her greatest asset was still there to pull the men in. She just had to accept that her admirers had been age appropriately adjusted. The looks she got now were from old men, not the young Turks of her diva days. Oh, this old thing. I just rushed to put it together. Lie. It took Aida at least an hour every morning to decide what to wear. And this particular outfit had maxed out her major credit card, the one she used exclusively for replenishing her wardrobe. But no matter, Aida was proud she dressed as if she still attended junior league luncheons. And customers seemed to appreciate her air of entitlement, as well as her fashion sense. She was highly valued. She knew it. So obvious. She was different and always had been went after whatever she wanted. Aida's the mother and grandmother, and she's so narcissistic, her two daughters, as far as she's concerned, are there only to serve her. And so she and her husband have gotten financially in terrible debt. And the oldest daughter, Julia, feels this tremendous obligation, even though she's been estranged from her parents, she feels she has to be the caregiver. And it's an extreme sense of obligation, so much so that it starts to affect both her marriage and her daughter negatively. And that's the story. Well, it's such great characterization. I could just see her. So you really described her so well. I was kind of influenced for Aida, the diva, and picking that name, Aida, uh, from the opera, from um, Tracy Let's Play. August Osage County, and several uh, of my author friends have made the comparison between the two. And then when I saw the dramatization with Meryl Streep playing the matriarch in that story, I kept thinking of Meryl Streep as I was writing that. And also, I like to think of um, different actors for different roles. And I think that brings it to life for me and makes it easier for me to write the character arc. That's, that's the way I write. I can see it on the big screen and I can see yeah. them playing out their characterization, you know, right in front of me. So I know what they're wearing. I know what they're eating, what they look like. And um, there's a media agent who is interested in shopping my book around to studios in Hollywood. And, and they asked me for a list of actors. I oh. wanted to to um, show, you know, for playing the parts in my book. And I said, you know, I knew who would play it 40 years ago, but I don't know all these young actors now. I'll have to go on the internet and look and see. <laughs> oh, I'll have to read your book and maybe I can give you some suggestions because I love to do that when I am reading a book. I always place somebody that I know is a phenomenal actor in those character roles, thinking maybe if this comes to screen, the book to screen adaptation should feature these actors. So I'll take a look. Okay, good. I'll look forward to that. Is there anything that your readers don't know about you? Well, I would think most of my readers don't know anything about me besides the book and maybe wondering, oh, what kind of person would write this and what was her relationship with her parents or with her friends? And um, I guess I would say art. I mean, I just love art, just like writing from the time I was a, a little girl. Art was the same way. I just loved all kinds of different art, took a lot of different art classes. I also love dance and took a lot of dancing. I think um, those two maybe readers wouldn't know about and gardening. Because we live in California, the gardening season is really 11 out of 12 months a year. So uh, I, if I need to clear my head and I'm kind of stuck on my writing, I'll go out and play with the dirt and transplant something. That's a great thing to do. I go out and ride my bike and I listen to audio books while I'm riding. So something about exercising and getting outside can can unblock Absolutely. some of our writer yeah. block <laughs> Absolutely, yes yes and writer's block um i've never had too much of it 
maybe because I'm not a self-critic, I would say that's another thing that ad, uh, advice I would give, I guess, to writers is don't let that self-critic take control of you. And I think that's why my writer's block doesn't last too long. I just shoo it away and make sure it goes someplace else. And sometimes being outside, as you said, can do it for you. Diana, you are a wonderful educator and, and have been for a long time. I know to your students that you had um, at Stanford, but do you have advice for our specific group of writers over 50? I guess I would say, as I um, said in my article, we all bloom at different times. And um, even though I had this novel in my head from the time I was a professor, it is not the novel I would have written as I was a professor because there's been so much life experience. So the novelist at 40 is writing a different story than over 50. And both stories are very valuable, very authentic. We all move through different passages in life. And I would say, don't be afraid and don't let age feel like it's some kind of obstacle to you. Because um, take as your model, Delia Owens. She wrote a fabulous, fabulous, probably the best-selling novel of the century, maybe even part of the last century. And she was in her early 70s. So I would say, never think of age as a barrier to writing what you want to write. Well, you're a wonderful example of that. So we certainly appreciate your being with us today. And we're so happy that you're one of our authors over 50. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.